Hello everyone, I'm Kishan the PV guy and today we are going to be talking about key performance indicators or KPIs in pharmacovigilance. So if we are part of any regulated industry, we may wonder from time to time how good the performance of my process is after all. And if we have set up and measured the KPIs or key performance indicators, we can relax after knowing that KPIs are about the target. In pharma and especially in pharmacovigilance, KPIs are not only a good idea, but they are a requirement set out by various regulatory authorities. For example, if we talk about GVP Module 1, it definitely says that performance indicators where they are used to continuously monitor the good performance of pharmacovigilance activities should be part of the documented quality system. Further, ICHQ-10, the guideline on pharmaceutical quality system, also says that performance indicators are a vital component of any quality management system. So let's first pin down the definition of KPI. Well, KPIs are key performance indicators, as the name suggests. But more thoroughly, KPIs are measurable values that can objectively demonstrate if a process or an activity is meeting its desired goals with respect to quality and or compliance. So it is your objective reference point that you go to in order to find out the health of your system or your activity. And these are the parameters which can tell you whether your activities or processes are in compliance with all the expectations that you have set out or not. So let's ask the question, what are the common KPIs for pharmacovigilance processes? But before we discuss specific examples of the KPIs used in pharmacovigilance, let's just say that there are two kinds of KPIs. One would give you the idea about the quality of the deliverable, whether the final product actually looks like what it was supposed to look like and the other one talks about the compliance with regulatory timelines or maybe internal timelines that you have set out for your activities. So those are the basic two types of KPIs, one about quality and the other one about timeliness. So now let's talk about what can be the common KPIs in pharmacovigilance utilized by a lot of companies these days. We will take ICSR processing and submission as which is one of the core activities in pharmacovigilance as the example for the KPI. So a company generally has obligations to submit cases whether pre-market or post-market cases to regulatory authorities. Apart from that, the company may also be submitting cases to some external agencies or external entities such as business partners or maybe other service providers or CROs. Also, company may have internal workflow timelines as well. For example, QC of a certain type of cases should finish by a particular day in their workflow. Similarly, there may be some internal rules about when the cases should be completely closed out or locked out by a certain number of day in their workflow. So those are some of the internal workflow timelines that you'd also keep a track of. So this table shows a very simplistic example of what timeliness KPIs would look like when calculated for ICSR submission activities. So we have types of cases, we have total cases in the month, we have how many cases are submitted on time and how many are late, the columns for those, and we have percentage compliance as in the percentage of cases that are submitted on time as the last column. So for an example, let's assume that for each kind of submission, we have the target as 99%. Also, the total submission compliance as in the KPI for how many cases in total when all of the categories of submissions, 7-day, 15-day post-marketing submissions and 10-day ICSR submission, let's say to a fictitious business partner XYZ, when all of them are combined together, how many cases are in total late? So let's say that the target for that as well is 99%. So you can enumerate basically in each line item how many cases were on time, how many were late, you can calculate the percentages of course, and as you can see over here, it seems like 15-day SUSAR submission to regulatory authority, we had 80 cases, 78 were on time, 2 were probably late. And so the percentage compliance sits at 97.5, which is below 99. So you can say that that type of ICSR submission is out of compliance as far as the KPI targets are concerned. When it comes to post-marketing 15-day ICSR submission KPI, uh, the situation seems to be a little worse. So we have 91 cases out of 100 that were submitted on time but 9 were late uh, which amounts to 91% of compliance uh, score uh, which is again below the target. Uh, of course 10-day ICSR submission to business partners uh, we have 
23 cases in total. We have 22 on time, one was late. But again, the submission compliance for that is 95%, which is again, below the target. Keep in mind that the target here is of course, uh, arbitrarily decided. For your company, depending upon the case volume, the criticality of cases, you would need to set up the target that makes sense as per your processes, basically. So it should be fit for purpose. It also should be risk-based. So you cannot justify extremely low targets and then you would be compliant all the time, but then it wouldn't really make sense in the eyes of the regulatory authorities. At the same time, if you keep the target too strict, it is definitely admirable, but at the same time, you wouldn't want to waste on fixing the problems that do not exist. So you do want to allow some flexibility. So 99% is probably uh, a good benchmark, but at the same time, it can be a little less than that. So once you identify where the problem lies, which category of submissions can use your issue management initiatives a little more, you will have to put in the efforts to rectify all the problems that are preventing the compliance score to meet the targets. Now, if we talk about the quality related KPI for ICSR processing or submission, uh, that is going to be achieved through retrospective review of uh, cases, or rather retrospective review of sample cases. Now, this is not in lieu of the regular QC that you have ongoing as part of the process that is very much warranted. That should be 100% ideally, of course, but to assess the quality of finished products as in the finished ICSRs in this instance, we would need to sample some of the finished products as in the ICSRs and retrospectively evaluate them with respect to the quality expectations that we have predefined. So this exercise will require that we predetermine categories of errors, basically what kind of errors are critical, what kind of errors are major, what kind of errors are minor. Now, terminologies may vary, of course, but the point here is that you should already categorize the severity of all potential errors. Once you have done that, then you determine the targets. And after that, you sample the cases periodically, probably every week, let's say every 15 days, or maybe even on a monthly basis. And then you evaluate those cases with respect to the error categories and check if the results meet the targets or they fall short. So for an example, I know a company that categorizes all the possible errors inside an ICSR into two categories, significant errors and non-significant errors. Their target was such that after the evaluation, 99% of the cases should be free from significant errors and 96% of the cases at a minimum should be free from non-significant errors. Now I also know another company that categorizes the errors slightly more broadly. So they have E1, E2 and E3, critical, major and minor errors. And of course, they would have to predetermine what error or what kind of error or error in what field within the ICSR would amount to E1 or E2 or E3. After doing that, they had set the target that they would like to see 99% of cases after the periodic evaluation of sample cases uh, to be free from uh, even errors, 97% of the cases at a minimum to be free from E2 errors, and 95% of cases to be free from E3 minor error. Now, if you ask what errors or errors in what fields exactly would amount to even errors, uh, the same for E2 and E3, then the answer would be that it should be based on the risk. You have some flexibility over there, of course, but those fields that are more critical towards uh, determination of the regulatory timelines or those other fields that can make a case expedited versus non-expedited or some of those fields which are too critical for the case to make sense in its entirety, those types of errors or those fields would be categorized as E1. Then other potential errors that are slightly less critical may be categorized as E2. And some of those other fields which are not too critical are important, but again, not too critical, uh, may be categorized as E3. So if you find that the error was in day zero determination or seriousness or expectedness determination, then those errors would be categorized as E1 most likely. Uh, similarly, if you have errors in reporter type, action taken, event onset date, and certain other critical but not so critical fields, maybe they can be categorized as E2 errors. And again, at the same time, if you have some errors in medical history or concomitant medication, uh, those types of errors probably can be categorized as E3. Again, 
this is just an example of course the company's preferences might dictate what errors are categorized across e1 e2 and e3 uh, depending upon the type of cases that they are handling or depending upon their medical rationale so once you have these categories predefined hopefully in a controlled document and you have set the target for each categories for the retrospective evaluation as far as the kpi is concerned you need to sample the cases most popular method that i have seen in my experience is the square root of n plus one that means if you have 100 cases let's say in a period then you would be wise to select at least 11 cases uh, in that sample which needs to be then evaluated under this kpi so let's take a simplistic example for this kpi as well just to see how the calculation for this kpi may look like so in this example we assume that we are performing retrospective review every month we have about 1000 cases in a month to derive the sample from. So in our case, it would be roughly 33 cases that we will have to evaluate at a minimum. Now, let's say that we evaluated those 33 cases with respect to E1, E2 and E3 errors. And we found that there were no cases with E1 errors, which is always a good news. There were two cases with E2 errors and there was one case with E3 error. So. With respect to their targets, E1 and E3 seem to be fine, whereas there may be some problems in E2 category of errors. So there may be something to think about when it comes to our case quality with respect to E2 errors or those fields that correspond to E2 error. So as you know, of course, pharmacovigilance doesn't just mean case processing, it means a wide array of activities basically that includes aggregate reports, signal detection, REMS or RMP activities and so on. So timeliness KPIs and quality of deliverable KPIs. Both the concepts can be applied to all of these activities and KPIs can be built with both the philosophies around these eight. Now, when it comes to quality system or quality management system supporting pharmacovigilance process or activities, there are other obligations that you would need to track quality and compliance within, such as training activities, CAPA activities, and audit conduct and reporting activities. So all of these activities that are part of quality system can also be kept on track by setting the deadlines for crucial steps in the workflow for those activities in advance and taking the sample to evaluate actual compliance with those timelines. Now, sometimes these measurements are called key quality indicators because these activities are part of quality system. However, the terminologies again may vary from one company to another. The point is that you have an indicator, whether you call it KPI or KQI, that tells you about quality and compliance of that activity. So the obvious question arises, what should happen when we don't meet the target for a KPI? Well, that's when your issue management exercise or deviation in CAPA investigation workflow should kick in. Now, I'm not suggesting that for every lapse in the KPI, for every measurement, you exercise a full-blown CAPA. However, what would qualify for a full-blown CAPA versus an ad hoc investigation? That should be predetermined in your SOP and it should be based on risk. But it would be conservative to say that every time you have lapses in your KPIs, you investigate, you document that investigation and you supplement that investigation with corrective preventive actions or corrections as appropriate. So that was the topic for today. I hope you had some fun reviewing the concepts of KPI with me today. I'll see you in the next video. If you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn yet, feel free to do so. Also, you might want to subscribe to this channel so that we can review many other concepts and many other things in pharmacovigilance and quality assurance together on an ongoing basis and thereby keep enriching our knowledge bank. Thank you. Bye-bye.